Welcome back. You're watching a special edition of The Farm. Now, India's equity markets tell the story of India Inc. rather well. In 15 years, the market capitalization of the Indian equity markets has grown from around 10 lakh crore rupees to 100 lakh crores. From 2019-99, the BSE Sensex surpassed 27,000 this year. The MSE Nifty has moved from 850 to above 8,500. And the number of investors has grown fourfold. In the past 15 years, India's equity markets have witnessed the introduction of dematerialization, derivatives and demutualization of stock exchanges. Add to that the launch of currency and interest rate futures, ASBA facility for investors and more distribution channels for financial products. Commodity exchanges made a debut and now total three. There are also three national stock exchanges. But exchange regulation came under scrutiny as the FTIL-owned NSCL collapsed, taking Jignesha's empire down with it. Former SEBI member and now a securities law professor, J.R. Verma warns that more complex challenges await regulators in the future. I think uh, one of the areas is with the uh, uh, emergence of new technologies, how markets are changing and uh, a great deal of disintermediation of certain markets is, uh, is going on. Uh, you know, there are several examples that one can look at. Uh, there is the, uh, um, the emergence, for example, of, of robo-advisors, uh, where what is happening is that instead of having a, a human portfolio manager uh, advising clients about what stocks to buy and how to manage the portfolio, uh, you have a computer algorithm which uh, basically decides what to buy and uh, tells the clients that you know these are the uh, trading decisions and these are the portfolios that you must hold. Uh, the question that would come is that uh, if there is a problem with that uh, in, uh, portfolio, uh, then whom would you hold responsible? Uh, whom would you regulate uh, for that kind of, a, uh, of an eventuality? Uh, would you say that the, uh, I mean you can't you can't hold the computer software responsible, right? You need to have some human being at the end of the day held accountable. So is that the person who wrote the computer code? Uh, is that the uh, organization which uh, ran that computer software on its servers? Uh, is it the person who sold this service to the uh, individual and so on? Meanwhile, the corporate debt market story has been promising too with bond market issuances increasing sevenfold in the last decade. Moving from FERA to FEMA, current account convertibility, partial capital account convertibility, introduction of credit default swaps and repo transactions in corporate debt securities. M&M CFO B. Parthasarthi says India has come a long way in addressing corporate finance requirements. Now, policymakers should move towards total capital account convertibility and frame laws that address the needs of hybrid businesses. There will be more companies like Alibaba, starting with e-commerce but also being like a mini bank. So different industries and different business models are going to emerge. So therefore, the new laws and the new statute will have to see how it takes care of all these environment. So new laws have to be in line with not just saying and guy in insurance business will do this. But what if a banking and insurance is together? What if a rural business is also along with insurance business? This holistic approach is sorely missing in India's foreign investment policies too. Yes, in the last 15 years, India has relaxed limits on foreign direct investment across industry sectors most notably in single and multi-brand retail and more recently in railways and defense. But our suspicion of foreign investors desiring their money but denying them control, imposing complex sourcing restrictions and finally slaying them with tax terrorism has meant India attracts only a fifth of the foreign investment China does. Veteran regulatory expert Vivek Mehra worries this approach will keep India in digital dark age. E-commerce is for the future. E-commerce is something that you have to live with. And in India, e-commerce is just about, I, I believe, just 1% of the total market. And therefore, I believe it needs to be encouraged. 
if it has FDI in it or if it does not have FDI in it, I don't understand how does it matter. If Indians who have deep pockets can also get into e-commerce, then how does it protect your marketplace? I believe e-commerce can help entrepreneurs sell goods just as multi-brand retail trading can. If we want to encourage entrepreneurship in this country and manufacturing in this country, the biggest bottleneck for entrepreneur manufacturers is the marketplace. How do they distribute their goods? How do they get it, get it out of the market? Well, it's impossible to talk about business and foreign investors and not talk about tax. 2012 marks India's most controversial tax law, a retroactive tax on indirect transfers after the government lost its case to tax the Hutch Vodafone deal. Soon after, India became the first country to impose transfer pricing norms on the issuance of capital, leaving business shell-shocked. BMR's Mukesh Bhutani says effective dispute resolution should be the government's key agenda. I think India should relook at its treaty policy to embrace mandatory arbitration. I know that the mandatory arbitration concept is prevalent more amongst the OECD nations, but even the UN now is prescribing that countries like India and other emerging markets should embrace mandatory arbitration, which means that if a dispute is not resolved under the MAP process of the treaty, you really resort to mandatory arbitration. Indirect taxation has seen both change and controversy. Peak customs and excise rates have fallen considerably. In 2005, India introduced value-added tax. And in 2011, service tax made an entry. And now, GST may be in sight. Well, maybe. We hope that the government will indeed uh, aim for the best, which is to make the GST applicable to the most comprehensive base of good, goods and services with uh, minimal, if any, exemptions. And the rate should be very modest and low because the government of India is only collecting 5% of GDP in indirect taxes. And that 5% tax revenue can easily be replaced by the GST rate of something in the range of 10 to 12%. And if the, if the GST is brought in at that level, uh, it can then create opportunities for additional revenues to be raised from indirect taxes by jacking up the rates to, from 12 to 13, 14, 15. Alternatively, if they make the mistake of bringing in the GST at very high rates, something like 20, 25 percent, then it will be a stillborn baby. And finally... What will India's judicial system look like 15 years from now? Well, in the last 15 years, there has been a mushrooming of tribunals, but without adequate resources or appropriate structure. Judicial activism grew, PILs multiplied, corruption came under scrutiny, and so did government policy. Cancellation of 2G licenses, mining bans, coal block deallocations, black money probes. The Supreme Court did some major national cleaning up. But the lack of resources and process has left one big problem unresolved, pendency. Senior advocate Arvind Datar says it should become a national priority. I would like to have a clean road map of what the central government and the state governments are going to do. First, to tackle the problem of arrears. As I said, uh, out of the 4 million cases pending in the high courts, 50% uh, are just in four states. Similarly, out of the 30 million cases pending in the lower courts, 50% are just in four states. So I would like a situation where state-specific solutions are thought of. I mean, what is the problem in Allahabad or Uttar Pradesh is quite different from what is in Tamil Nadu. So you will have to have state-specific solutions for tackling the problem of arrears as far as the subordinate courts are concerned. At the High Court and Supreme Court levels, I think I would like greater attention to be paid to a transparent process of judicial appointments. I think the National Judicial Commission will not be a proper answer. Well, the 15th and final effort at crystal ball gazing comes from none other than the firm team. It's less forecast and more expectation, or should I say hope. 
that laws, regulations and court orders will be simple, short, better written and easier to understand and comply with. And with that, we'd like to say goodbye to 2004.